Before I start, I have to say a sincere congratulations to the Philips HR team for the wonderful work you all do on Twitter. And I think you guys are an absolute role model. So Zenobi, I follow you, so I see a lot of your tweets. Uh, I think you're doing absolutely a fantastic job. Um, so I was talking to Zenobia and um, you know, trying to figure out what do I talk about today. And uh, she suggested talking about leadership skills and what are the, new, what are the diff changes that's expected of leaders today, especially given how the environment is changing around us. So on that topic, um, you know, had a very interesting conversation last night at dinner with uh, quite a few industry leaders who were sort of, who had got together uh, to chat about India, what's happening in India, environment, etc. And halfway through the conversation, one of our friends who's um, an American, he is in India on an expat um, assignment with one of the uh, IT companies, sort of threw up his hands and extremely animated, uh, frustrated style sort of it that, you know, if today you have to be a successful leader in India, you have to be either a Mother Teresa or you have to be someone as ruthless as Darth Vader. It's like, wow, I mean, seriously, a Mother Teresa or a Darth Vader, nothing in between. But, you know, we all had a good laugh. But um, thinking about it, I, I, I can get that frustration and I can get where he's coming from. Today, as a business leader, the only thing that we can be sure of, and it's not just India, it's any market anywhere in the world, is that whatever we are doing right today will not be right tomorrow. That's the only thing we can be sure of. Whatever it is that's working today is not going to work tomorrow. Period. Right? That's the one thing you know for sure. As a business leader, the constants that we have to deal with today are change, ambiguity, volatility, complexity. These are sort of day-to-day. -day. This is what we have to deal with pretty much on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you talk about leadership challenges, I think the biggest leadership challenge today is to really figure out how do you navigate through all these complexities, chaos, changes, and get your business and your people to the desired end state. And to make it a little bit more complex, the desired end state is a moving target. It keeps changing because the market's changing. So what's good today is not good enough tomorrow. So how do, you, how do you stay on top of it? How do you come to terms with the fact that maybe my targets are going to change halfway through? And I know that strategies are going to change. So how do I still keep the team motivated and how do I navigate through it? Right? That's today the biggest leadership challenge that I think all of us face. Um, you know, any leadership book you read will tell you that the right thing to do is prepare for a crisis and be ready for it. How do you do that when you're in an environment of sustained crisis? That's the environment today. It's a sustained crisis, it's sustained chaos. Those are the only things you can really be sure of. One day the rupee is at $60, the next day it will hit $68, and guess what? There's nothing you can do. You just have to be ready and you have to be ready to change your business strategies so that um, you can minimize the loss and maximize whatever opportunities out there. So we, we just have to be ready for it. And um, you throw in technology to the equation and the frequency and the, 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 the frequency and the, you know, the, the, the rate at which change happens gets amplified 100x more. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you an example, right? Um, how many of you heard of, uh, well, let me ask, how many of you know who invented the world's first digital camera? Kodak. Sorry? Kodak. Kodak, right? What happened when they invented the camera? They gave it up as a non-event. They said, this market does not exist. Why? Because the technology at that time was incredibly um, poor. And because of that, the resolution was incredibly low. So the picture qualities were really bad. 
what Kodak did not visualize or did not think through is that technology is changing much faster than anything else. And therefore, if you decide on the future of something based on what it is today, you are going to take a wrong decision. So the words they used was, this is a non-event. And they decided that this was not for them, right? So that's the complexity that technology brings into it. Today, when you add technology to the equation, you are basically dealing with changes that are of an exponential nature. It's not sequential. It's not arithmetic. You know, one of the founding laws of technology is Moore's law. And Moore's law, basically, very simplistically, it says that um, you know, every two years, that the processor will basically double in performance, right? Uh, Anything doubling in performance can be pretty mind-boggling when you apply that to your business. Um, if you, if you I have an example here of cars, if you applied Moore's Law to cars, then the Rolls-Royce would basically get you half a million miles per gallon, and it would be cheaper to buy it, uh, to, to just buy a new one, than pay the parking fees. That's what we're talking about. That's the kind of change we're talking about. Right? That's what technology brings to the game. Now you can say, whoa, this, this, is, this is super scary, and you can back off, or you can figure out a way to embrace it. Now, one more complexity to be added, which is the data explosion. Think, think about it. Today, um, by 2015, there, there will be 15 billion connected devices. And Two trillion dollars intelligent systems in use. Those are the numbers. What does it mean? Let's let's talk in terms of data, right? In 2011, the amount of data that got created was 1.8 zettabyte. Anyone wants to take a guess at what is a zettabyte? Ten to the power nine. Any other guesses? I'll give you a hint if it helps. It is a uh, trillion gigabytes, if that helps. <laughs> Basically, it's one followed by 21 zeros. I'm bad in math, but 21 zeros is a lot of zeros. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of zeros. So that's the amount of data you guys, we are creating, right? Uh, if, you, if you just want to make it simpler, it's 450 billion DVDs or 113 billion fully loaded iPads. That's the amount of data just created in 2011. In fact, Eric Smith, uh, the ex-CEO of Google, had a very famous saying where he said that every two days today, we create as much information as we did from the dawn of civilization up to 2003. That, that's the kind of data that's being created. Now, flip it over and think what it means for you. Think what it means for a business leader. When you think of the opportunity, it's one of the biggest opportunities that's being handed over to you to get to understand your customer better, right? Um, for me, personally, someone who is pretty active on social media, just understanding how the consumers or the people out there, the users, are responding to Intel, you know, every Facebook like, every comment, every tweet, when you pull all that together, the story it tells you is so much more powerful and so much more real than any survey you can ever hope to buy. It's a fact and it's real time. It's telling you how they are responding to you and your products and your brand. They like you, they don't like you, they're angry with you. The truth is out there. But you have to have a lot of courage to, able to be able to accept that truth, right? So, and that is, you know, there's a lot of talk of big data. Very simplistically, that is big data. It's, it's basically looking at all the data out there and it's trying to figure out what does that data tell you about your products and how can you use the data uh, to get to know your customers and to be able to customize what you are offering in a way that will be relevant for them. So, again, what does this mean uh, to you as a leader? It basically means that today, as a leader, you have to embrace change, you have to embrace technology. There are no two ways about it. Technology is no more the domain of the IT guys or the CTOs. 
That's a fact. Uh, show me a leader today who says he's scared of technology and I'll show you a disaster that is waiting to happen. It is extremely important for leaders to embrace the tools that's out there and that can help them figure out what the future is going to look like. It's going to get incredibly difficult to predict the future. Consumers, cultures, behaviors, likes, insecurities, values are changing day by day. What is relevant today is no more relevant tomorrow. And, you know, for a company to do well, I think the key is staying relevant for your consumers. If, if, um, if I have to sell a product, I have to be relevant to you. You, may, you have to want to buy me, right? And if, if your lifestyle, if your values, your likes changes, what you value and what's relevant to you also changes. So I think the biggest mistake we make today is taking anything for granted. We can, just because the brand is valued today, it does not mean it will be valued tomorrow. You cannot take that for granted. You have to figure out what is the consumer thinking, what is changing in his or her mind. And therefore, how do you change to stay relevant? And that's where technology, data, the analytics play a huge role. And it helps you build that competitive edge. And I think lastly, um, the other big tectonic shift that is happening is related. It's the need to constantly innovate, the need to constantly experiment. I mean, think of, take, take the example of IT in India. India has been uh, highly successful uh, when it came to creating technology solutions for worldwide use. But when you look at India, the domestic consumption of technology computing technology is one of the lowest worldwide. Yes, we have 900 million phones out there, but what are the phones being used for? Technology in India will be truly meaningful when it starts getting used as a means to deliver education, financial services, government services, healthcare to every single citizen in this country. Today, the maximum and the best usage of technology is to update your Twitter or Facebook status. Or maybe to just what, download some videos. That's what most people are doing. Right? Now, for us to change the game and for us to really take technology to the grassroots levels in a way that is relevant, in a way that will increase usage in the areas which will contribute back to development and growth, the IT industry in India has to innovate like it's never innovated before. It's a huge challenge in front of us. You know, even though we are the third largest internet base worldwide, not one of the Indian languages feature in the top ten internet languages. Do all Indians speak English? No. Eighty percent of Indians do not. And guess what? We've already covered the people who speak English, you know, the 20% who speak English are already covered. The next, the next uh, range of users are going to be non-urban, are going to be non-English speaking. So how are we going to reach them? We can't be doing what we do today and expect to reach these users. We have to innovate, we have to think differently. And with that comes the requirement to, um, to be able to handle failure. I think for a new generation leader, that's one of the biggest requirements today because when you are in an environment when, where you're asked to innovate, where you're asked to try different things, when you're asked to take risks every single day, you cannot be guaranteed of success. Some will succeed, some won't succeed. And I'm coming back to India after a long time, but one of the things I do find in India is it's much more difficult for us to handle failure than most other people. I don't know, maybe it's the education system or whatever, but we hate failure. Failure is a bad word. It, it, how many of you have gone into business meetings where your managers or leaders have actually talked about failure? We don't. Most of us don't. Because it scares employees. You have to change that. Failure is not the end of the world. 
as long as it's being looked at as a learning opportunity, as long as you are able to learn from it and figure out how to get more clever, how to get more effective and how to get more stronger when you hit back. That's what's needed. So, you know, there's so much happening in the environment, all these changes are taking place and I definitely believe that it, it, um, it demands a lot of changes at the top of the companies, more at the top than anywhere else. You need leaders almost with a, with a new re-engineered kind of a DNA to be able to lead, to be able to navigate through the chaos and to be able to keep uh, the teams motivated in today's world. I mean, first and foremost, I think you need leaders who are tremendously flexible. Uh, there is no such thing as a long-term plan anymore. <laughs> you know, you, you, you had strategy and planning, and, but I'm sure you'll agree that, uh, you know, I don't think any of us look at three-year plans anymore. We, it just doesn't make sense. In fact, I don't even know if one-year plans make sense anymore because the market is just changing so fast. I mean, personally speaking, uh, for Intel India, I go back and review plans monthly and sometimes maybe weekly if I have to, if the market is changing pretty drastically. Because what's important today is not that great PowerPoint foil with a very impressive sounding plan. What's important today is for you to be able to spot the changes as quickly as possible and give yourself the freedom to go and make the changes or course correction that you need to make and as timely as possible. You cannot wait till three months is over when you have your plan review to say, oops, we had missed this, so let's go and change it. You cannot wait. You have to be flexible and you have to do it on the job. Um, you have to be tremendously agile. Uh, today, decisions have to be taken pretty much on the go. Um, so many times your people will come to you and say, we need a decision in the next one hour or we're going to lose the business. And that's, that, that's how businesses work today. So you have to be agile and you have to have the confidence to be able to take the decision. Um, the, the third one um, I think is a pretty important one. I think in today's world, Leaders have to remove, frankly, throw away all the blinkers we have traditionally worn. Today, we need the best talent to be successful. We need new thinking to be successful. We need different thinking to be successful. And talent, there's no guarantee that talent comes in any particular shape, form, or gender. Talent comes in all shapes and sizes. Talent comes in both genders, and talent comes in all sorts of ages. And you have to have the confidence to be, to be able to recognize the talent, not get biased by any of you know, the, all the stereotypes that we have grown up with, and be able to embrace the best talent you find, no matter what the, ta the talent looks like. And I think that is an extremely important one for today's leaders, especially an extremely important one for leaders in India. It is extremely important. Um, embracing younger employees, I think Philips has, from what, from what you were telling me, Philips has done a fantastic job of embracing younger employees. Um, how do you keep them motivated? How do you give them a chance to rise to the top? Is your leadership level still the 50 plus? Or are you allowing newcomers to rise to the top faster because they have new ideas? That, that's something we have to grapple with. And I think that's something as leaders, we have to figure out how do we change maybe the values and the mindsets we've all been brought up with. Because it's basically that. You, you, you brought up thinking something, so how do you change that? And how do you open the doors to, uh, one, how do you create an environment of equal opportunity? irrespective of gender, irrespective of age, and um, how do you, and this is where I think HR plays a key role, how do you spot the best talent, and how do you groom that talent, and how do you give the opportunities to the talent to rise? 
um, no matter how little or how long time they've spent in the organization. That, that's a very, very important one for organizations to think about today. Um, authenticity is another one that I value personally a lot. You know, in, in times like this where things are changing so drastically, there's a lot of insecurity in the organization. Everyone's worried, will I have a job tomorrow? If I don't have a job, what happens to my family? All employees are worried. And, and they have a reason to be worried. At these times, I think earlier we used to pay a lot of importance to you know, communication as in um, what in layman's term we would say the smooth talkers. The leaders had to be really glib communicators, right? I don't think that helps that much today. It still helps. You, you need to be effective. You need to be good communicator. But I think what people are more and more looking for is an authentic, is a credible communicator, someone they can believe in, especially when you're working with younger people. They're still looking for role models. They're still looking uh, for someone that they can put their faith in, they can put their trust in. But they're not going to put that, um, they're not going to trust you, they're not going to follow you, they're not going to believe you because of your designation. That's very clear. That's gone. You know, today you don't lead because of your designation. You have to earn the leadership. You have to give them a reason to believe in you. You have to give them a reason to follow you. And that makes you work a little bit more harder as a leader. Right. And last but not the least, I think it's, um, it's something that the founders of Intel have paid a lot of emphasis on, which is um, the greater ambition. You know, it is not just about building a successful business. It is about building a successful organization that generations after generations of workers can be proud of. And I think that by itself gives employees uh, a meaning, a, a, a value that they can, they can really hang on to, they can treasure, and that can motivate them, especially when you're talking about younger generation. We often make the mistake of believing that sometimes the softer values um, relay, you know, sort of appeal more to the older generations. Actually, I'm surprised to see how much they appeal to the younger generations. They want something to believe in. And you, you have to give them that. So, you know, these are some of the changes, I think, um, that the whole leadership process is going through. That, you know, as leaders, we have to evolve. It's, it's a, I call it a, a rebirth, because you have to sort of unlearn a lot of what you know, and you have to learn a lot of new things. So this whole journey is like a learning opportunity. And um, you have to pretty much learn on the job, and you have to deliver while you're learning. It's very simple, but it's fun because it's, it's reinventing your scope, it's reinventing what you do, it's, 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 it's reinventing how you look at your job and how many of us have the luxury of saying that, okay, I have a completely new um, challenge in front of me. So I look at it as a positive, I look at it as an opportunity. Uh, but at the end of the day, as I said, leadership is not about designations, leadership is not about who you are. Um, my mentor at Intel always told me that Leadership is about being the best version of yourself. It is about, um, especially when times are tough, it is about rising above the rest and being the best version and helping the team or guiding the team um, to reach a better spot or reach a better place. So I think what becomes extremely important for each one of us is to figure out what motivates us to be that best version of ourselves. All of us are capable of it, but do, are we in a position that where we feel motivated to do it? Because it is a lot of hard work. For me personally, um, coming back to India was, uh, was a passion. It was something I had dreamed about for a very, very long time. Um, in fact, one of my old Intel colleagues, Moshumi, is right here, and I think uh, she knows that even when I, when I joined Intel, I was a uh, very, junior bacha, as they used to call it, marketing exec. Uh, it's 17, 18 years, actually. Come Jan, it'll be 18 years, 18 years back. 
Um, but from day one, in fact, from the time of my interview, I had the audacity to dream big, and I had the audacity to communicate that to my managers. Um, from the day I was interviewed, I always told them that one day, you know, 20-year vision, I want to come back and I want to run India. So it was very clear in my mind that that's what I want to do. And every single manager I've had at Intel, the first discussion I've had with them is that, okay, that's my goal. So are you going to help me? How are you going to help me? So it's, it's always been about, you know, that's the goal I want to work towards. How are you going to help me in that journey, right? So coming back to India was that passion that I was looking for, was that opportunity that I was looking for. And it wasn't just about coming back home. Yes, that's important, but what excited me about India was this market, more than any other market, needs technology. If you, you know, every government and, uh, I mean, everybody in India talks about inclusive growth. What is inclusive growth? Very simply put, inclusive growth is when every single person, man or woman, in this country has access to education, health, good health care, has access to services, government, financial, and knows how to use it so that they can improve their livelihood. In other words, so that they can improve their ability to earn more and contribute more to the family, to the community, to the country. That's how growth takes place. That's how development takes place. Given the complexity of India, you cannot do that without using technology to reach the grassroots. So the, so the role of technology in India is, is tremendously important and that's something that had always excited me about this country. The opportunity to, to make a difference with technology. So finding my passion was extremely important. I found it. I was able to come back in a very difficult time. But you know, I look at it as a glass half full. I think this is the best time to be in India because this is when everything is getting, it's in a churn. So use the churn as an advantage to reinvent the business, to reinvent yourself. I, and this is a new beginning. So for me, it's a great opportunity. It's, it's also an opportunity to learn a lot. India is a very humbling marketplace. It really uh, tells you or it, it teaches you how little you know. So it's, uh, you, you know, it's fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating um, trying to learn about this market and trying to learn about, you know, 30 odd different countries all under one umbrella. It's, uh, that is ultimately what is India. Uh, but it, it's an absolutely fascinating experience and it's what encourages me to be my best. So I guess what I will leave you with is the question, um, what encourages you to be your best? Because once you find that, um, you find the strength to overcome all the other challenges and be a leader that people are willing to follow. So with that, thank you again for the opportunity. I'll be happy to take questions if we have time. And thanks again for being such a wonderful audience.